So I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, today we have Cole Wilder with us. Um, he is a teacher uh, right here in Radford and we're so excited to have Cole um, presenting for us today. Uh, so if you do have a question, um, there is a chat box. You can type your questions in there. There is a question and answer section at the bottom. If you ask the question, we'll make sure that Cole answers it. Um, or you can raise your hand if you feel comfortable and want to come up on video. Um, I can bring you up uh, when Cole has a minute to stop and answer some questions. We can do that as well. So um, thank you, Cole, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Frank. And uh, absolutely, if anybody has a comment, question, or just wants to share something, please let him know. Um, I am going to reserve a, a lot of time at the end uh, for sharing ideas and asking questions. But again, if uh, if something pops up in the middle, please feel free to jump in. Uh, if not, I'm just going to kind of go through it. And uh, I'm here today to talk about uh, innovation in education. And I've always thought I've been an innovative teacher, but I've, I've realized lately that, especially with what's going on now, that what I thought was innovative wasn't always innovative. And so here you see me. Uh, hopefully everybody can see the screen. Let me know if, I, if you can. And um, this is me violating the governor's a closure of school. I've snuck all my kit and I'm joking. This is actually a picture of uh, my class one year ago. Um, we did a virus simulation and uh, I'm going to talk a lot more about that late, uh, later on in this presentation, but uh, we kind of simulated that a, a virus had broken out in Radford and a lot of the things that our country is doing right now, our kids actually got to do last year. So uh, we were actually in the plan of uh, of organizing in the sixth grade, redoing this at, on a bigger scale, but uh, it happened for real, so we didn't get to do that. Um, but I'm gonna talk more about that in a little bit. We're gonna start off, and I hope the audio works. We tested it, so it should be good. Uh, usually when I speak, I, I like to perform one of my raps and have everybody else rap and stand up and dance with me. Uh, obviously, we can't be in the same room, but I still think the best way to do that is I'm gonna show one of my videos. Uh, I would perform it for you, but the audio lags a little bit. So uh, this is the writing rap from back in my time at, at, at Roanoke. The words are there, so I expect wherever you're at, you'll be up and singing the song. Here we go. All right, students. At the end of this class, every student in the room will be able to write a perfect essay. It don't matter what the prompt is. So sit back and pay attention. Yo, yo, imagine a world where you are the king. That's how I feel every day. See how I grabbed your attention. Now you will listen to every word that I say. My writing's magic, call me magician. Start every paragraph with a transition. When I am done, I include a conclusion. That'll make sure there is no confusion. Who? Oh. Time for my thesis. Just give them a claim and three reasons. This is too easy, please. Can't you see I'm a beast? I do this with ease. My sentence variety gives wannabe rappers anxiety. If you looking for me at the bottom, comma, you ain't gonna find me. We vivid, Joe. We elaborate. We just might write a perfect paper. A perfect paper. Our sentence variety just might make us famous later. All our haters keep talking. They think that we cheating, but we typed every single word that they read and we read it and revised and edited. Do you realize where we're headed? It's evident. Look, a 100 essay for me is probably no problem. I use examples and details that you probably wouldn't have thought of. To the teachers who don't use this rap in your class, man, y'all are whack. Man, y'all are whack. All my fans using fanboys mainly because of this track. Because of this track. I'm vivid in every sentence. I appeal to your senses. My figurative language so endless. All my students can sense it. Speak to the audience. It's so appalling when someone's off topic. Just checked on the prompt again. Can it be that we on top again? Yeah, we vivid. Joe, we elaborate. We just might write a perfect paper. A perfect paper. Our sentence variety just might make us famous later. All our paper. haters keep talking. They think that we cheating, but we typed every single word that they read and we write it and revise and edit it. Do you realize where we're headed? It's evident. As you can see, writing ain't really that hard. Gotta learn how to do it cause writing can take you so far So get out your pencil and get out your paper It don't matter what we can figure out later Just write it so vivid they actually picture it Like it's a dream but they actually live in it I just might And I'm gonna cut it there I hope that you were participating Frank I hope you were sitting there performing as well um, This was actually from uh, back at my time at, at, uh, 
at James Madison Middle School in Roanoke. Uh, we had a writing boot camp where we had all the students who had, had struggled on their writing simulation uh, stayed after school for a couple days. And instead of, you know, just hitting them with worksheets and everything, we actually made this music video to go over steps of the writing process. And we, we had some pretty good results. Uh, the, the kids had a blast and just trying to make writing fun. Um, about me, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I know uh, I saw a couple of the names. I, I know a lot of you, but for those of you who don't know me, my name is Cole Wilder. I currently live in Radford uh, here with my wife, Jenny, and my daughter, Myers. Uh, here's Myers at one of the one of the Radford games. Myers is a season ticket holder, so she's always there. I apologize. She usually, right after a halftime, gets kind of cranky because she uh, gets to walk around, and then when it's time to go back to her seat, she gets cranky. So if you've been at a Radford game and uh, we had to take her out in front of you, I apologize. Uh, but uh, I've been at Radford University for a long time. I went in 2006, where I was a member of the basketball team, all the way through 2010, and and uh, graduated in exercise sport and health education. Uh, and then I stayed around and I uh, did the education program and got my master's in 2016. And currently I'm in the, um, in the um, educational leadership program. Um, and I am an aspiring school administrator. So I've been in college at Radford for a long time. I uh, love Radford University. Uh, right out of college, I got a job at James Madison Middle School and I taught there for seven years and I absolutely loved it. Um, honestly, growing up, I never wanted to be a teacher. Um, but Dr. Doerr, um, many of you know Dr. Doerr kind of talked me into it, and I've been stuck here ever since, but I had a blast there, and I honestly never thought I'd leave Roanoke City Schools, but um, then I had an opportunity to come teach at Bell Heath Elementary in Radford, and I've, I've been there, and let me tell you, uh, if you haven't been to Bell Heath Elementary and you're in the area, you need to email me, email Ms. Grant, the principal, and come walk through, because there's really some amazing things going on. A uh, couple other things. You, you, you saw the video, uh, I do have uh, educational rap videos. My YouTube page is US History Rap, so feel free to go check those out. I have a bunch there. Uh, new hobby I got this year is I got to call the, the Radford Home Games uh, on ESPN Plus. Um, so I'm just all about some Radford University. I love Radford and always uh, looking for ways to help out. So when I got this opportunity, I was super excited. So I'm gonna go ahead and start here. And again, at any point that anybody wants to jump in, please feel free. Uh, my first year teaching in 2011, I was a civics and a history teacher. And here are the problems that I worked with my kids on solving. This is kind of, this, this was my job to teach them how to solve these problems. Uh, the first one, which amendment provided women with the right to vote? The 14th, the 18th, the 19th, or the 21st. So if you want to answer in the chat box, feel free. Uh, and the second one uh, that you might have, that I might have worked with them on, was which major battle of World War II turned the tide in favor of the Allied powers in Europe? Uh, the D-Day invasion, the Pearl Harbor, Stalingrad, or Midway? Um, and uh, I'm not gonna brag about myself too much, but I got really good at teaching my kids how to solve these problems. And here are some of the ways that I did it. And I thought I was being innovative. Uh, for, every, for every unit, I made a rap video. Um, and I've actually had over a million views now with all of my rap videos. Um, and my, my kids would learn the words and we actually at times would have problems uh, with uh, on, when we were testing with kids while they were taking the test, uh, actually saying the words out loud. So that was an issue. Uh, every Friday, sometimes Thursday, we would play trash can basketball, which was a review game where if they answered a question right, they got to shoot and we had teams. And then I also did a ton of other review games. And I thought I was being really innovative because my kids were getting really good. They were having a lot of fun figuring out how to solve these problems. Um, but what I realized later on is, and I actually got this quote from a, a school, uh, I'm sorry, a book, What School Could Be, is I was really just finding innovative ways to do obsolete things better. Because when you look at our current crisis, these eighth graders are now, you know, 23, 24 years old. They're in the real world. And here are the problems that they are solving. How to keep their business going despite the stay-at-home guidelines. You know tasks that we've typically done face-to-face -face that we can't do that anymore. How do they do that online? And for people in education, that's a real challenge because education is something that we do face-to-face. -face. Um, goodness gracious, if you're somebody who's in a position where you have to work with a budget, how, how do you make a budget with the unknown economic future? And I'm not going to read all of these, but uh, when I was teaching my kids how to solve these problems, was that helping to prepare them to solve these problems? And I, I would argue no. 
um, although I was really good at what I was doing, I was almost doing the wrong thing in a sense. And we are preparing students for challenges that don't currently exist. And if, if you don't believe that statement right now is, is, you know, complete proof of that. In 2011, my first year teaching, I did not know that when my kids first hit the workforce, they were gonna be doing it under these circumstances. And we act like this is very unprecedented, but it's really not throughout history. You know, if you look in, in the 1930s, you know, kids that were in school, did they, did the teachers, did they know that, you know, a few years later, there was going to be a global war, you know, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, did we know that uh, as we were preparing students that things were going to be done almost completely using the internet? This is stuff that's going to keep ha happening. So my question is, what challenges are, you know, I'm a sixth grade teacher right now, what are the challenges that my kids are going to face when they're 10 years from now, 2030, much less 2040, 2050, I put up a couple of, you know, I Googled what are some jobs of the future? And honestly, some of these, I don't even know what they are because they don't exist yet. Um, so are we preparing our kids right now for the challenges or could we do better? And I would say that, you know, I don't want to speak for everybody, but me personally, although I think I'm starting to grow in this area, I still am not completely preparing my students for what they're gonna face. So how can we do better? And I think it's a shift in the type of learning that we do. Uh, right now, I am really good at this and I know a lot of teachers are really good at this because it's, it's how we learn and it's what we're used to and we've kind of mastered it. Uh, traditional learning, it's where we, we tell the kids what they need to know, we teach them how to do it, usually with memorization, and then we give them a problem at the end. And the purpose of the problem is to show us that they know how to do it. What if we flip that around? What if at the beginning, we gave our kids a problem? And then from there, they figured out what they needed to know and learn and apply and solve the problem. I, I don't want to sound like I'm somebody who is a SOL test hater or a standardized testing hater. I actually love the test. Um, and I don't see anything wrong with the standards or the test. I just copied and pasted a list of, you know, I'm a sixth grade English teacher. Here are some of our standards. And, you know, my wife, Jenny, who actually just left, she did a good job with Myra. She actually uh, it, it, it is heading into work right now. Um, but she is undefeated in arguments, as am I. And we would, it, I think we would both lose a battle if we tried to say that either of these anything on this list was not important for our daughter Myers, who's two, to grow up and learn. These are all important things. Just like these, these questions right here, these are off of a 2015 released SOL test. Our kids should know how to answer these questions. So I don't think there's a problem with the testing or with, with the standards. The problem lies in it's all about the standards and it's all about the test. And it, I love this cartoon. And I, when I first saw it, I thought it was ridiculous, but it's so true. Is this the test to test us? For the test to see if we are ready for the test? And I know we, that sounds ridiculous, but uh, for those of you that aren't in education, here's what kind of my instructional calendar looks like. At the end of the year, I have an SOL test. Every nine weeks, I have a benchmark test, and kind of the purpose of the benchmark test is to figure out strengths and weaknesses so that when we take that SOL test, you know, the kids are prepared. And then within that benchmark, before the benchmark, every couple of weeks, we have like a mini quiz or a mini snapshot to where we see where our strengths and weaknesses are so that our kids can do better on that benchmark. And then sprinkled in around all of that stuff, we do do fun things like uh, project-based learning and problem-based learning. But I don't think it should be that way. And I, I think a, a lot of people in education are shifting that view that instead of it being all about the test and just sprinkling in some you know, some of this other real world stuff, they should be on equal, equal footing. So what if, and, and by the way, none of this is my idea. This is all stuff that I've read and I'm gonna share some resources, um, share some resources later on if you'd like to read more. Um, but what, what if the why, what if the reason that we're teaching these standards wasn't so that our kids did well on a test? Um, what, if, what if there was a bigger purpose for why we were teaching them? And I'll, I'll just say, Virginia is, I think, being a leader in this category with uh, the superintendent, James Lane. Uh, Virginia has established these, these five C's that are important for preparing our students for the real world. But although we have these five C's, are these really a priority? At the end of the day, I just feel like everything still goes back to, are we mastering those standardized 
test. And this stuff right here is sprinkled in when in reality it should be, this is just as important as the test. And I, I think a common argument is, I, I hear you Cole, I, I hear you, this stuff is important, but are our kids gonna be able to succeed if they don't master those standards? And I, I agree with that, but I would reverse the question and ask it this way. I agree with you that the, these standards are important, but how are our kids gonna succeed if they don't master these? So I would argue that they're 50-50. And I, I think the way to navigate this, and this has started, this is something that I was not an innovator. I wasn't first on, I've jumped on the bandwagon. I've learned from actually a lot of teachers at, at, at Bell Heath, honestly. Um, Project-based learning and assessment, I think, is, is the way to go. Um, again, I know I'm talking a lot. If anybody wants to jump in at any point, feel free. Uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit about this project that we did. I apologize. Sorry. Um, so our virus outbreak lesson. Um, basically, what I wanted to do is we took a whole week. Um, and I actually spent $20. It was very cheap. You know, a lot of times money is, is listed as an obstacle. This was very cheap. What I did was I uh, uh, designed the whole room to look like an outbreak center. And what, what the problem was a new virus had broken out in Radford and all of the students were special scientists sent from the CDC and special doctors to figure out how to not only limit the spread of the virus, but also find a cure. And it's just it's very ironic that this was a year ago and this is exactly what we're dealing with in the world right now. Um, we started off with reading a passage about uh, Spanish influenza outbreak in 1918, 1919. And um, so all the standards that we have to teach, we're still teaching. Um, they're, they're still in this. Our kids are still, st still reading, um, but it's a little different. So right here, you see an activity we did with inferences. So instead of going in with the mentality, I'm gonna teach my kids how to make an inference, and then I'm gonna give them a project to see if they know how to do it. What if we taught our kids how to make inferences through the project? So the first activity that they did after they read the, uh, about, about the outbreak um, was they were doctors, and I gave them 15 patients that had come into the hospital. Now, not all of these 15 patients had the virus. And at this time, nobody knew what the virus was. So what they had to do is they had to read the, um, read the patient profiles and figure out what are the symptoms. Because if you don't know what the symptoms are, you can't identify who has the virus. So instead of just telling them, hey, the symptoms are everybody has a fever, they cough, they sneeze, they had to figure it out on their own. They had to make inferences. And then from there, um, they had more patients that, that came into the classroom and they had to uh, identify who had the virus and who didn't. And then to take it a step further, because one of the skills that students need to know is putting things in chronological order, they had to determine who got it, at what point, and from where. And from there, they had to make some, t some very difficult decisions on who needed to be quarantined. And uh, there, there necessarily was no right or wrong answer to these questions, you know? The discussion came up, oh, this person might have the virus, but should we really quarantine them? Uh, because they have a job, they have a family they have to take care of. Um, so I, I really feel like there was some real world learning there. Um, but there you see one of the candidates who came in, Barty Martin, they had to read his, the, the summary from the doctor and, and determine if he had the virus or not, and if so, where did he get it? Um, and then we took it a step further. Uh, the, unfortunately, we did not contain the virus to Radford and it spread, and so students got a list of the spread uh, based on different scenarios and actually had to map it out. And this is uh, the kind of the answer key for the map. But after the kids had made the map, they had to come up with a plan. And again, just some great conversations uh, that were had. There was no right or wrong answer. But I mean, we had some, some I remember one student said, oh, well, it started in Radford uh, and, it, and it had really spread in Richmond. What if we blocked off the interstates right here and locked everybody in and locked everybody in here? And again, you have those tough conversations uh, where there are some pros to that, but there's also a lot of cons to that. Um, moving on to Jurassic Park. We did Jurassic Park this year in the sixth grade and Jurassic Park was such a blast. Um, we did it as a, as a sixth grade team. Uh, here you see Candace Davis, our sixth grade science teacher. Uh, I forget exactly what she did in the room, but she had black lights and, and they did kind of sciencey things. Here you see the desks in uh, Heather Rowland's class, our math teacher, and, and 
uh, the students, when they came in, instead of just sitting in a normal desk, all of the desks had been turned into Jurassic Park Jeeps, um, which I thought was a gr great idea. And here you see me. I was, I oh, forget his name, the guy from Jurassic Park, the, the main scientist. That's who I was. And uh, here's, here's Dr. Dora, who a lot of you know. Um, but I'm going I'm to go over this project a little bit. Uh, this was another thing where we gave the kids a, a problem, and there were no right or wrong answers, but they had to use their knowledge to figure out uh, the best way to to solve the problems. Um, kind of the premise was they are now in charge of building their own Jurassic Park. And in a couple of days, we're gonna have investors from the community come in and you're gonna have to pitch your park to them. Now, uh, there's a couple guidelines we have, have for you. You know, there's a certain amount of budget, the dinosaurs and the employees and uh, the facilities all cost a certain amount of money, uh, but it's up to you how you wanna do that. Uh, we, we told them they had to make a marketing plan, but again, uh, some kids made songs, some kids made commercials, some kids made made posters. Uh, here you see a kid that had, had made a made a commercial, and here he's showing off his his uh, commercial to an investor. Uh, I love this group. Uh, they actually had several restaurants in their theme park, so to kind of push investors in the in the right way, they uh, coordinated with I, I believe Sal's uh, Sal's Jr. and um, and I believe El Charo and brought in some food that the investors had. Uh, this is this is one of my favorites. This kid, you can tell he's not happy right here. And he's not happy because it's, it's about 10 minutes before the big presentation. And not not one, but both of his partners are not at school this day. And so here he is on his own. Uh, in fact, some of the materials that he needed uh, were in the book bags of these other students. Um, I wish I had a picture afterwards because he absolutely nailed it out of the nailed it out of the park talk about creativity you can kind of see right here what one of their marketing strategies was they were giving away uh to um uh kind of as a raffle dogs that had been bred with uh triceratops and if you look closely you can see the triceratops head on top of the dog and uh when we did this project investors had five minutes with e each group uh but this kid's group each time uh kind of went past that 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 five minutes and uh, although it was unfortunate that his his partners didn't show up he had to figure out on the spot how to uh, compensate for that uh i almost get emotional watching this picture um this is another one of our students who uh um, is presenting his project to mayor horden and what happened was mayor horden couldn't come in during the uh, time that we we had the exhibition he came in he came in later so i had to pick a few groups to go in the hallway and kind of to be respectful of his time, I told him, you know, all right, uh, I'll give you five minutes per group. Uh, I'm in, inside teaching the class. This student is out presenting and about 30 minutes passed by and I, I was like, man, I forgot him out there. And I, 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 I pop out and that's when I take this picture. Um, he did such a fantastic job. And uh, you see, he, here's another group. I want to show you a quick, I'm not going to show you the, the whole thing. Uh, this is a, about an 11 minute video. I'm just going to show two minutes of the kids actually presenting. Um, we had, uh, I want to say close to 30 community leaders come in and I can tell you about it, but I think seeing it will, um, absolutely help you to understand what type of stuff we were doing. I, I was very nervous because I felt like something might have gone wrong or something, but then like when I started talking to them, I felt good about it and I thought I was going to get it. What about people who already come, maybe somebody who's in a wheelchair or somebody who might be hearing impaired in these special things? We'll get one of our employees to question because the question that they asked us, we, some of them we were ready for, and then some of them we just didn't think. One thing that I would have changed about the project is probably made more details about the map and I bought more dinosaurs with my budget and spent everything and did everything I wanted to what was in the souvenir shop or, or the gift shop. And I was just like, oh, like little stuffies or little bags and pencils that you could get. That would be like the main gift shop. So it was like stuff that you could get. He had told me, what would I do if my power went out? And my 
my plan was that I had backup generators on all of the islands. So uh, I hope you could see it there. When, when we had our community leaders come in, we told them, we do not want you to take it easy on these kids. We want you to come in and ask them the hardball questions. And man, they absolutely went in and grilled our kids. And uh, each kid got to present five times. And the first time they really struggled, but with each time they, they, they grew a little bit. And my argument for this type of learning would be, why is, why is that type of performance, that type of assessment, not just as important as our standardized testing. So again, I'm not saying that the standardized testing isn't important, but what if throughout their whole educational career, in every class, multiple times a year, our kids got to do that type of thing. When they hit the real world, man, they would be absolutely ready to go. Um, and you know, I'm not gonna get into a deeper conversation, uh, but I actually think that, you know, it could become part of our standardized test. Again, I don't wanna do away with the, multiple choice format, because I do think that's important. But what if, you know, and we, we already kind of do this with our, with our, with our writing as so well. Um, we have half of it is a multiple choice test. The other half is a written essay. What if that's how we assess students and therefore judge teachers and schools success? What if we said, okay, you have your standardized test, but the other half of it is, for example, you, you get to choose one of these four projects. So the, uh, the very first one, imagine you are a business owner and have a job opening. Create interview questions to ask potential candidates and then decide as a team who you should hire. That could be one. You get to design your own school from scratch. Create a budget that includes facilities, staff, and educational resources. Then create a presentation to pitch to the school board. I'm not going to read them all, but what if that's the type of ways that we were assessing our kids? And when we're teaching them all of the, when we're working with them on these, these important standards, why can't we incorporate more of this instead of just sprinkle it in? Because I'll be honest, as a teacher, uh, I hope you don't think I'm an expert because I'm absolutely not. You know, what you saw is about as innovative as, as I've been. Uh, the majority of the time, I am still in that testing, testing, testing mode. But what if instead of testing, 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 then sprinkle some of this in, it was a constant mix and it's all done together uh, throughout the year. And uh, last thing before I really open it up to some questions and ideas and discussion is that the most important component to this, I believe, is, is getting the community involved. Um, if you are a teacher, you gotta reach out to your community. Um, we, we uh, I wanna say we contacted 50 people uh, for our Jurassic uh, Park project. And we had over 30 volunteers. And honestly, the ones that couldn't come just, just you know, was kind of short notice, had a schedule conflict. Um, and we tried to, because it was a Jurassic Park theme park, we tried to reach out to Radford University marketing professors. We had a biology professor. We had, um, we had local business leaders. We had local people who are in the food industry. Um, tried to bring as many people in uh, to r really give our kids a very well-rounded uh, experience. And um, this is just a fact. Hopefully you could see it in the video. And I, and I know other teachers and schools that have done this have seen this. The student, th this is a fact. Again, I don't have actual numbers for you. I'm just saying with my own eyes, I've seen this. The students are gonna work harder and they're gonna learn more for a showcase to community members than for a standardized test. If, if we asked our kids, which would you rather do? that project or take an SLL test, they're always gonna pick that and they're gonna work their butts off. Um, I, and, and again, I wanna say this, this one last thing. We have you know, kids who really struggle. We have achievement gaps. We have students in special education. We have, uh, we have students in different uh, subgroups that really struggle. And some of which are not gonna pass their SLL test. But in that project, they, went above other students who would not only pass their test, but get advanced scores because it's just two different levels of skills. So um, with that, uh, quick resources. Uh, if you haven't seen Most Likely to Succeed, you should watch it. Uh, it's a great documentary on a school called High Tech High. Um, I have put the wild card here, Move Your Bus by Ron Clark, anything in, uh, involving the Ron Clark Academy, very innovative school. Um, and then a book called What, what School Could Be, who's, uh, written by the same person who did most likely to succeed. And there's plenty of other resources out there. But with that, I wanna open it up, Frank, if we can, I actually might stop sharing. And I'd love to hear uh, just what are some other ideas 
for this type of learning? Uh, who are some people who uh, have their own ideas that either they've done in the classroom or ideas that they'd like to try? And if we have any, you know, uh, non-educators, any business leaders or community leaders, what are some things that you could help partner with us on? So with that, Frank, I'd like to turn it over um, if possible. Absolutely. Yeah. If anybody has any questions, um, you can raise your hand and I can actually bring you in um, your video in um, to, to have a discussion. Um, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, feel free to write it in and we can answer the questions or write in your ideas. <clears throat> I don't see any hands are being raised yet. Oh, we got a couple. Here we go. I'm going to bring uh, somebody in that you know quite well. I'm going to bring in Tara Grant. I will let her. Uh, Tara, you should just be able to um, turn your video on and your mic on, and it'll let you, it'll bring you in yourself. Maybe. So I can talk, but there's no video. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Do you want video? Because I can give you video. Oh, it does not matter. It doesn't okay. matter. Um, I will say, good job, Cole. Way to go, buddy. Way Thank to you. represent the Bobcats. But something that Cole talked about, um, and for, you, for you, you guys that don't know, I'm his principal, but we actually work together. You know, I'm not his supervisor. We all work together. And um, this has been a... Um, a school-wide initiative. Can you guys still hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, a big part that he talked about that's huge was the community piece, and we really try to do um, that very well. Um, and a way to get your community involved is social media. So if you want something done at your school, you need money, you want support, you want representation from the government, RAP University, you get on there and you promote the good things going on in your school and you try to put it in the paper. People will notice, parents will notice and support you and you will get some resources, whether it's money or people to come help in your school. Um, and, and that does another thing. It, it really causes the kids to be invested in their own community um, because they're making a difference and making connections within that community and our community is Radford. So, um, really think about how you promote your school and what's the good things that are going on there. Um, that's huge. And that just kind of lays the foundation for getting other things in the future. Good stuff for teachers and for kids. Good job, Cole. I'm proud of you. Thank you. We have another person. I think I just, Caitlin, you, oh, maybe. You disappeared. You can bring your video in, Caitlin, if you want, or you don't have to. Oh, there we go. All right. Hi, I am Caitlin Leitner. I am a Radford alum. Um, hi, Tara. Thanks for inviting me to this group. Um, Cole, love your discussion today. Um, I think it's so relevant. It reminded me of myself um, as an educator. Uh, that was me when I was in the classroom. Uh, I had my kids rapping. They were singing. We were standing on desks. I mean, anything and everything to get them to pass this lovely, I'm going to use kind words, test. Um, but you're right. We're in a whole other situation and problem right now, as in, does that really matter? Um, while that content and information is vital and um, it's here for a reason, and I mean, that's why we all have jobs, what is the main purpose behind knowing um, some of these factual things? So it's kind of made me um, shift my thought process. I'm currently a science specialist, so I'm over all science teachers K-12. Um, and so science, I feel like, is one of the easiest things. You can go outside and science is right there. But I liked your statement as in the project-based learning um, and the 50-50%, as in, yes, while the standards are here for a reason and they're important, what are they getting from it now with this crisis and this problem? Um, so I think that that is a very valid statement. I think it's going to shift our mindset as educators. Um, and I agree. I, I appreciate the superintendent and his vision that he has for us with these five C's. But I also strongly agree with you that it, it can't be something that we just sprinkle in because that is everyday life. So some of the resources that I've provided for my division here in Suffolk and Hampton Roads 
are activities like the five C's doing things for, to build, you know, citizenship, the communication skills, while I'm still trying to tap into, you know, our standards, I think being a good communicator and an effective and productive citizen is equal, if not even more important. So I appreciate uh, you bringing this conversation to light because I think that it needs to be heard and it's definitely going to change um, the way that we see education and what our students truly need to be able to succeed, especially with real life events such as this one. So thank you so much. Thank you, Caitlin. I'm sorry, I muted myself. Uh, if anybody else has any questions, feel free to raise your hand and I can bring you in. Um, oh, we got another one. Stephanie, I think, unless I just made Stephanie disappear. Stephanie, you should be able to turn your camera and your, there you go. Hi. Well, Stephanie's at the beach. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you for all of your great ideas. This is so inspiring. I think your classroom is exactly where kids want to be. And I think that's the goal for all teachers is to have the kids have fun and learn along the way. Um, I have a few like logistic questions for you. I wrote four of them down. Um, and with this project based learning, I'm going to try to like bite off a chunk to do it for one unit next year and just kind of see how it goes. So my questions are how long did that Jurassic Park unit actually last? Um, how far in advance did you have to plan for it because you were inviting people in? Um, how much notice did you give those people? Um, how did you evaluate your students on whether they were successful on the project? And how did you group your students? Because I know I have certain students that would dominate the whole presentation and I have some who would go and not say anything. Awesome, great question. So. Uh, first of all, this is this was the first time we did it as a uh, sixth grade staff. So the Jurassic Park was a first time experiment. Um, I didn't do it all. I did less than some other teachers did. Uh, the sixth grade teachers all kind of came together, um, and and uh, so to 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 try to break that down for you, um, we kind of broke it up by subject level. So the English teachers designed some part of it, the math teachers designed some part of it, then the history and science kind of added their own spill into it. Um, as far as picking the groups, um, I, I wanna say each homeroom did it differently. Uh, it was kind of, a, kind of a pick your own group, but there's a couple groups I'm a hand pick uh, and pick your own group and then I'll look at it and I might make a few adjustments. Uh, I think a couple other teachers assigned groups and I think that probably worked better than mine did. Um, but I, I, I do like giving the, the kids a chance to work with their friends, but at the same time, mix in other personalities. Um, as far as preparation, uh, I saw Candace, Heather, y'all are here. Feel free to jump in if you want to. I want to say we spent probably three weeks in advance planning it. Um, and it really helps being in Radford at Bell Heath because Radford University is lit less than a mile. So I basically sent an email to all the department chairs at Radford University um, and just because it's so close, we were able to get some quick responses. Uh, so I want to say about three weeks in advance uh, next year when we do it, because I, I, we, we've definitely planned on, on, on doing this again. Um, we'll probably do that much more in advance to get more attendance. Um, one thing that you couldn't see that uh, if you watch the video later on, you'll be able to see is we had a, a teacher, Lori Blackwell, who uh, redesigned the entire hallway and uh, I want to say she spent at least a week hanging vines and we put up blow up dinosaurs throughout the uh, school we had uh, Mr. Reedy one of his one of our English teachers had a huge speaker that was blaring the Jurassic Park theme theme throughout the whole school so the poor other grades probably were about tired of us we hid some Chromebooks behind the dinosaurs under boxes so that they were constantly roaring and making other dinosaur noises so um there's definitely some things logistically that we'll do better next time but i think what you said is important biting off chunks again i, I don't want it to seem like every day you walk in my classroom it looks like this it's quite the opposite uh very rarely does it look like this in my classroom but it's something that we we kind of do in parts and hopefully by adding a little bit each year eventually we'll get to where it's uh I would say the majority of that. Did I answer all your questions? Uh, um, yes, most of them. One of them was how do you evaluate oh, them? 
Yeah, so what we did is we, we actually let, because the purpose of this was uh, to pitch your idea, we didn't necessarily evaluate. We gave a checklist to all of the judges and what they did is uh, it was a rubric and they graded them in certain categories. And then we took that and we, we used that as the basis for our grade. But another big component of it was reflection afterwards. Um, what are some questions that you got asked and you just did not answer correctly? You had no idea. Um, so that was also a part of it. And then there were a lot of many assignments that were a part of it. Um, again, I can I can only speak for English. Like, you know, we had a couple reading passages related to dinosaurs that we did, but kind of all that mixed in. Um, so. I did just add Heather in so she could Heather, join in this conversation. Honestly, she could probably answer more. Um, she probably did more preparation than I did. Go ahead, Heather. No. Hi, Stephanie. I'm the math teacher with Cole. It's, uh, we have a great team that works together to make things happen. But for math, we were able to do things like um, perimeter and area when they were calculating cages and budgeting because we gave them a certain amount of money, but the dinosaurs cost a certain amount of money. And then they had to figure out based on the type of dinosaur, how much security they needed for each um, dinosaur. So it was a very interesting project, but something that Cole has mentioned, when he did his pandemic last year, my classroom, I didn't have anything special that week. So about two weeks later, I did Roland's Pizzeria. So, so like Cole said, this isn't something that happens every week. We have two or three bigger units that we plan for the year and that's it. Because just like you, I was afraid to bite this off and really go for it. But I'm also the kind of teacher that's in your face and singing and dancing and carrying on as well. Um, but it can be overwhelming for the kids if you do too much at one time. So Jurassic Park was, like Cole said, the first time that we had done it all together um, and really works through the process of it. And it was such a big hit that seeing that video brought tears to my eyes because I'd forgotten the magic that happened during that week. Um, we did, we started very, very basic planning this and found um, an outline already pre-made online. And then we took it as a team and made it what we wanted to make it and applied it to our standards in sixth grade. Something like that can easily be done for different grade levels. You can do this at all grade levels. It doesn't just have to be sixth graders who are capable of interacting already. That's the whole point. You're teaching these things to all of the kids as you go. Y'all are wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, Stephanie. Fairs, Candace. Hey, um, I just wanted to hop on to kind of talk um, about Stephanie's evaluating point. She was asking, like, how do we evaluate? Um, I teach sixth grade science at Bell Heath um, with Cole and Heather, and I did a lot of project-based things in science this year, um, and rubrics are key. And so when I would start something, I would kind of start and just give them the guidelines, and then about halfway through, I would give them their rubric um, so that they could kind of see what was being graded. Um, and then I would let them at the end, they would present to their class, like to their peers, to the other classmates, to myself. Um, and we, I would have the rubrics, their classmate would have the rubric and we would grade them and kind of just give them little critiques, things they can improve, two stars and a wish, um, kind of stuff that their classmates did for them. And so now not only did their classmate that they're evaluating get some extra helpful, hints and ideas and things they think they need to improve on, the person that's listening also kind of thought, oh, I should have done that or I should have done mm -hmm. this. Um, and so then by the end, when we do get those other people from the school, whether it's other teachers, other classes, or other community members like we do with Jurassic Park, they've had time to make changes, make it better, improve what they're doing. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that it's really important if you do do some kind of little project-based room transformation as big or as small as you want it to be, um, using a rubric that's easy for you and your kids to understand is huge. Mm -hmm. um, and that 
has really just been this year that I've learned that, um, that I have always really hated rubrics because I didn't know how to really use them well. And so I started creating my own rubrics this year for these projects. And I now love a good rubric. Um, so I'll just say when you're looking at evaluating, giving them time to make changes and giving them time with that rubric to really make those changes is also something that's super helpful with evaluating their work. Something real quick that we added um, this year was they they used their rubric and graded their group and graded themselves and then we had ours and a lot of times I would take the average of the three because you're going to always have that child who thinks I did the best of everything and grades themselves through the roof when in reality they may not have been a good group mate and so their group can reflect on that without them knowing and you can provide them that feedback. It's all about getting that information and delivering it back to the child so that they can become better. Awesome. Does anybody else have any other questions? So yeah, a little bit more time if anybody does. And Frank, I also just saw it, saw it come up in the chat. Um, you know, is, is there a way that I'll be able to provide this slide? Maybe uh, if I give it to you, could you email it out? Uh, Absolutely, yes. To all attendees. Um, and I'll also say that, you know, if I saw Taylor posted my, my email, um, if you want any of these resources, uh, please feel free to reach out. I'll definitely uh, see if I can provide them with you. Um, again, if you're a community leader and, and you have an idea and you want to try it, um, we are the ones to contact because we will try anything, whether it works or not. If it doesn't work, we'll get back to the drawing board and try to fix it. Um, one more thing I did want to add is uh, one thing I think you'll find is the kids that are typical straight A students really struggle with this because what they've done is they've learned to navigate school um, in the standards based a multiple choice assessment way. And when they're given this type of activity, they get frustrated. Uh, you'll have some issues. Um, they'll uh, keep asking for help and you just have to say, this is for you to figure out. And you'll find that the kids that struggle with their standardized testing, uh, they're not stuck in that box. They tend to do better on things like this. Um, so I, I, I just thought that was another interesting observation. Uh, I'd love to hear like an, uh, if anybody else has something they've done in their room. I, I know I see some Bell Heath people uh, that I know have, when I walk by your rooms, there's awesome stuff going on. I'd love to see hear a few more real quick. Uh, we may have had a question back. I'm trying to go through the chat just to make sure we got everything. Sorry, I'm unmuted myself, but someone has asked um, how something like this would work with third grade students. Um, and so I didn't know if there's anyone in here that may have a response to that question. Um, I know third grade at Bell Heath does a lot of things similar to this. Um, and so I didn't know if any of them were in here, they could hop on because they would have great insight on that. If you want to hop on, you can just raise your hand and I can uh, give you access to join us. I mean, I, I can't speak for third grade specifically, but I mean, I really think this stuff could be adjusted for any, any level. Um, I think one thing you want to be careful of is saying, oh, my kids are not old enough to handle this. You know, our sixth graders did stuff that the old Mr. Wilder from my first year would say, oh, this is this is high school stuff, Bring, you know, having, uh, bringing in community leaders to ask questions about budget and marketing and, you know, accommodations for, for, for handicap. Um, that's stuff that sixth graders can't handle, but what you'll find is I think they really adjust towards that. So um, I really think it could be adjusted. If anybody has an idea for how you could do that for third grade or older grade, I'd love to hear it. I wasn't, um, I hate, I don't want to be this person, but <laughs> I was in third grade before this year when I went to six and there's Holly. Yes. Um, I know that, th that we had done some different room transformations and stuff um, that were awesome. So I, I'm so.
Holly, hey guys. You're, <laughs> yeah, you're good. I want to okay. hear from Holly. Holly's Holly's a rock star. This this should be good. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, so a recent room transformation that I did was a crime scene for the day, and Cole actually was part of it. My kids like attacked him because they thought he was a suspect, <laughs> but um. We just kind of, I gave, gave them a problem and said Ms. Grant had been kidnapped. They need our help solving the problem. So I set up a crime scene. I had documents of like interviews from different people. They went through a checklist to draw conclusions to try to figure out who solved or who kidnapped Ms. Grant. And it actually was a sixth grade teacher and they were running through the school. They were highly engaged. Um, after all the chaos, we came back together and they had to answer some questions and fill stuff out. So that's kind of how I evaluated them for that. Um, but just anything to make it more exciting, I feel like third graders, they buy into everything. Does anybody else have a question? You want to say anything? You can raise your hand. Um, we will, I will be sure to get uh, this presentation from Cole and email it out to everybody um, that was here today. Um, doesn't look like we have any other questions. So Cole, I want to say thank you for, for, uh, for presenting today and thank you to all of your uh, coworkers for joining in and uh, giving their take on it. Um, we're getting a couple thank yous in the, in the uh, chat box. Um, so Thank you, Cole. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We will be back next week um, with another um, webinar on Tuesday. Um, and it is another education webinar. So uh, be on the lookout for more information on that. Um, and I'll make sure I put that in the email that we send to everybody. So if nobody else has anything, um, we will finish this up. But thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you, guys.